right, so we got a special guest on the podcast today. Four-time Super Bowl champion, part of the 74, 75, 78, and 79 Pittsburgh Steelers championship teams. 13 seasons in the NFL with the Pittsburgh Steelers. NFL's strongest man, competition winner. <laughs> One of my five, five brothers, <laughs> Mr. John Cobb. What's up, baby? How are you doing? Hey, isn't it great that we have sort of a fellowship of five, five brothers? I I, I love, uh, you know, last year we got to take that picture of all the 5-5 five, five guys. Oh, yeah, so, man. Me, yeah. you, uh, Devin, Jerry O. All we're missing was Jerry uh, o. We were missing Peasy. Yeah. That was the only one at the time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Cool. I mean, I just think that's neat. It is, man. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. And, I mean, in terms of people that set the tone for that number, you put the bar up there, man. <laughs> <With that. laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. And, and, you know, just to hop into this thing, man, you were a part of two teams with the Steelers that went back to back in terms of winning Super Bowls. You did it in 74 and 75, and then you turned around and did it again in 78 and 79. So just describe what it was about those teams in particular that made that possible. Um, you know, and I I will tell you this, one of the main things, and you're probably not going to believe it, but uh, this is the <laughs> truth. Uh, our, uh, I was, um, I was in new Orleans for the first super bowl and, uh, it was, it was an amazing season. You know, now you, you, you're in new Orleans, you're playing the super bowl. The cool thing about it. One of the cool things was my college roommate, who was also the best man in my wedding. Mm. We've been roommates at Oklahoma state university. We actually played, we met in the high school all-state football game in Oklahoma. So that's where we met. We, we were roommates. So now we're in New Orleans. We're playing the Super Bowl. The cool thing was that New Orleans, excuse me, that the Vikings had gotten beat the year before by the Miami Dolphins. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we'd been in the playoffs for the first time the Steelers had in 72. Everybody thought we were going to come back in 73 was the year. What well, didn't work out. It ended up being the Dolphins. And so we're, we're now we're there in 74 and uh, Bud Grant and Chuck Noah, are, so they're kind of cut out of the same cloth. And uh, so we weren't supposed to see them and they're not supposed to see us. But that's the head coach rule. Right. But I had snuck out with my <laughs> family and Terry's family and we had dinner together. And, you know, and it was after practice about three days before the game. And so we're walking back to the car. I didn't feel any guilt because we just had dinner. <laughs> but so Terry, Terry was trying to do this side game. And I, he said to me, I don't know if you know this, Arthur, but you get a runner up ring. Mm. So and they don't call it runner up <laughs> ring. So, so they had the NFC championship game had ring. If they had won the Super Bowl, they would get a Super Bowl championship ring. Right. So he's trying to he's trying to kind of give me a play this mental game, and he he shows he says he shows me their NFC championship ring, and he says, "Oh, by the way, let me show you the ring you're going to get." And oh, I said, "What do you mean <laughs> ring?" And I said, "What do you mean ring?" And he says, the ring you're going to get. And I said, why would somebody give you a ring for playing in a, in a, in a ball game? <laughs> and he says, you idiot. You don't even know you get a ring for playing in the Super Bowl. And I said, no, I didn't know you got a ring for playing in the Super Bowl. <laughs> and, and so, uh, so I went back to the, the hotel and my roommate, Sam Davis came in a few minutes afterwards. And I said, Sam, do you know, we get a ring for playing in this ball game. And he said, why would they give you a ring for playing in a football game? And so we went, you know, we went the next day or so we're asking, did you know, we get a ring for playing in this game? <laughs> there was nobody on our team, Arthur, that knew we were going to get a ring. Wow. <laughs> and, and so, so I think that was significant because we were playing to win a ball game. We were playing to be the best. We were playing because there was a group of guys that had gone through the season together 
and it was never about the ring. Mm. And and so I think because it was never about the ring, if it's about the ring, then when you get the ring, where's your motivation to do it again? You got the ring. Absolutely. But after the game, I remember guys saying, man, that was that was really fun. Let's do that again. But if you got the ring, then you got the ring. But if it's about uh, and and there was a there's a book called Man in the Mirror. Mm. And and the premise of the book says this. It says um, the purpose is the the, or the process is the purpose. The process is the purpose. The goal is the relationship and the plan is God's. And and if you take each one of those three things, the process that you go through, that's the purpose. So the process you go through for a football season or the process you go through to get a a degree in whatever you're studying or the process you go through in a business, if if that's the purpose, then you're, 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 judging what's going on by that process and mm-hmm. what, how it builds you inside out. And then the goal is the relationship. And, and I think that's, that's very true too. My roommate, I just talked about, uh, we were roommates for 10 years. Uh, uh, Sam Davis, uh, his funeral was just a month and a half ago. Mm. Uh, everybody came, uh, you know, and, and I probably talked to Franco and Larry Brown and some of the guys more in the last from the time of Sam's death to the time of his funeral than I had in several years because that uh, relationship that we developed uh, that that brought us back for that funeral and then the last thing he said the process is the purpose the goal is the relationship and the plan is God's and so I buy into all three of those things and I think there was a, a whole bunch of guys that bought into all three of those as well and so you asked me a simple question and it took me 15 minutes to answer you, <laughs> hey but, i like it though man you're but, dropping but that, gems <laughs> I, that's what i believe was about those guys there and the other thing uh, uh i think you know there's some guys that wear their rings but not everybody wears the rings because i don't think they needed a ring to, uh, you know because it was the process right. so yeah no, I definitely respect that. And I think of it, obviously, I didn't win a ring, but I think of it in terms of guys when they get these nice contracts. They always talk about some guys, They once they get paid and they get that big time check, that they turn it down. They stop working as hard. They're not as hungry to be successful anymore because they feel like they've reached their goal. Whereas the guys who every day just wake up as if they have to prove something, they work out as if they have to prove something. It doesn't matter if they're the highest paid guy or on the minimum wage. They're always going to show up and have that same level of dedication. So I definitely can understand that, man. Yeah, I think and I, I agree with you 100 percent. One of the best things that happened to me, Arthur, as a, as a player, as an athlete, is um, I, I'll try to make this one quicker. But the night before one of our games, uh, my oldest son, Eric, and he was like a seventh grader. He had a wrestling match. And, and he, so I go to the match and, uh, and it turns out he's wrestling this guy that looks like McGilla gorilla. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going, how can these guys weigh the same? It can't happen. <laughs> Don't, you know? And, and so they, they start the match, they shake hands and, and this guy just slams my son down and he's beating him all up. And, and at the end of the first period, uh, Eric had spent most of the time on his back. Mm. And so the second period, the other guy started to wear down a little bit. Eric just keeps pitching in there, gets a takedown, right, lets him right. up, then gets him takedown, lets him up. And so it turns out with like five seconds left to go in the third period, Eric's fought back to within one point. They're both on the feet. He shoots, he gets the takedown. Uh, excuse me, he was uh, he was two down. He gets the takedown, ties it up. They go into overtime. He wins in overtime. Nice. And when the, and and when they held his hand up, he could you know he he just kind of dropped it, and he just kind of he he didn't jump up and down. He was just so fatigued. He he had left everything out there, and and so anyway, the next day. We're playing San Diego. They're terrible. First pass, <laughs> Fouts throws an interception. Mel Blunt takes it back. 
<laughs> okay, so we're up six to nothing. I haven't been on the field. They kick off, and Lynn Swan was r- running kickoffs back, and I think he ran it. Anyway, we're up 12 points, and I haven't even been on the field. The <laughs> wow. been on the field. And by the time halftime comes, uh, we're up. The game's done. Okay. And so <laughs> two minutes left in the half, first half, we're talking about where we're going after the game. And, oh, you know? wow. and, and anyway, it was one of those situations Arthur, <laughs> where I looked up and you know how you see there's 50,000 people in the stand, mm. but I saw my son's face mm. there and, and what happened and this changed my career because it was about my fourth or fifth year. And what happened is the night before I'm thinking, you know what? He was not the best wrestler. That other guy was, mm. but he was the best that he could be. And that prevailed and he won. And the guy, I won't bring up his name because I'm not trying to, but <laughs> I was just kind of, the game had, you know what I'm talking about when the game is reduced to just going through the motions Absolutely. and stuff? Because the game is decided and you just, you're finishing the game. And, you know, I wished I would have been able, so they call a timeout. And I wished I would have been say, uh, been able to say, hey, Paul, the guy's name, actually the guy's name was Paul Costa. Hey, I just had this epiphany. <laughs> And I'm going to come off the ball now, and I'm going to quit playing around, and I'm going to come off the ball now, and I'm going to try and break your jaw. <laughs> and, and, I, <laughs> and so when they called time, I didn't have a chance to do that. So when oh, they called man. time in, you know, we ran 19 straight, which is Franco right over left hat, right over me. And I came off the ball, bang, and I drove him. He wasn't expecting it, so he got driven on his back, and he's going like, He's going, hey man, what's it? And he starts talking trash, you know, and <laughs> and I just said, buckle up. Hey, <laughs> talk to him. <laughs> but but to your point, that changed my 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 career in terms of, you know, it's not about just being the best. What it's about is being the best that you can be. Absolutely. And and so anyway, now you've got two stories and we probably only have two minutes left. <laughs> hey, no, we're good, man. Listen, I'm loving the stories because this is stuff that people need to hear about. This is stuff that people want to hear about. And it's not always talked about. Everybody always talks about the stats, right? Oh, how many touchdowns or how many t- uh, how many stars did you have and things like that. But the stories are what make you you. The stories are what give it life. So, man, we definitely appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, the stories are what make the process the the whole thing and you know what uh, I, I i can fast forward to about eight nine to my 13th year and i'm playing against a guy named jesse baker who's six eight and 287 i'm six three i weigh 252 and i'm 35 years old and <laughs> and it's the two minute drill and uh you know, it's my 13th year and this guy is 30 pounds, uh, uh, heavier. And, uh, and I remember at the, you know, I was, it was just kind of like, hang on, man. And, and, but I, at the end of the game, I thought, boy, that was ugly. Uh, <laughs> but then I thought, you know what? It was the best you can be. So it works both ways. No question, man. I like yeah. that. But at the end of the day, like you said, it's all about being your best. And speaking yeah. of being your best, the fact, I mean, everybody talks about how hard it is to win a Super Bowl. I mean, that's the one thing that, I mean, I chased it my whole career, was never able to get there. You were able to win four. So out of the four, which one means the most to you and why? Um, for, for for a long time, I, I didn't think I had, I, uh, you know, I tell you they're all the same. But uh, now that I've, you know, I think, um, and, and part of it, author to be honest and i hate people to say they're being honest with me because i always wonder what they're <laughs> when they're lying was that other stuff so were you lying line? just a second ago is that what you're telling me <laughs> yeah you yeah, said i was exactly. your favorite <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah and it was i would answer my typical answer was like which was your favorite kid but the the third okay so we won two and then we were in the playoffs but we didn't get to the super bowl and so the uh so we won nine and 10 and then we were out 11 and 12 and then we came back and won 13 and 14. Well, Super Bowl 12, the Dallas Cowboys won. And so Harvey Martin was the defensive end that I played against forever. Okay. And Randy White was the defensive tackle and they were co MVPs 
of Super Bowl twelve because they just they just I don't know how many combined sacks they had. Reckon havoc. <laughs> Yeah, but they were yeah they were just destroyed. So all week, um, you know, you you play, you practice the first week at home, and then you travel to Miami or wherever the Super Bowl venue is, and you travel there, uh, and then you you know you have a pre, you know it's nice because in Pittsburgh it's snowing and blowing, and and you go to Miami and you're practicing, so. Every day in the paper, all the new TV channels, who were they interviewing? Harvey Martin and Randy White, because they were the MVPs. And so all week, I had to listen to mm. uh, what was going to happen. <laughs> uh, and, you know, were they going to repeat as MVPs and that kind of stuff? And then to make it worse, my wife is going, did you hear what they're saying? <laughs> you know, oh, <laughs> <laughs> and so... You know, I loved it because on the first play of the game, and I, you know what, it's funny. I can't, I can remember high school scores, but I can't remember, I can't remember stuff. It just, you know, it blends in. So what the the first play, it was like Chuck was, Chuck Noll was doing me a favor. First play, again, was 19 straight. The play I was talking about was mm -hmm. San Diego, which is Franco right over left tackle. We pick up seven. First play of the game, pick up seven. And the second play is a tackle trap, which most people don't run today because tackles are so big they can't pull. Right. And uh, so uh, Leroy Jordan, their middle linebacker, I love the tackle trap because uh, he steps up. It's not, you know, and Sam Davis, the guard, isn't pulling. So he he sees the guard block away. He's not expecting the tackle to come around, and you get deer hole the middle linebacker. He doesn't see you coming, mm -hmm. and you know what it's like when you get deer hole. Oh, I'm gonna say, That's listen, fine. I hate I hate getting ear hold. Love the ear hole, <laughs> hate to get. <laughs> yeah. So the second play, you know, I got the ear hole uh, the um, the middle linebacker. So now I'm jazzed. I'm ready to go the rest of the game. <laughs> you know, and and so. Uh, you know, and, and we, had, we had transitioned to mostly a run from mostly a running team to, uh, uh, the last two Super Bowls, you know, Terry was coming into his own, he's throwing the ball. Uh, and we, the game, the, the, uh, one of the differences in the game was almost all of our dry, his drops were seven step drops. And Terry, if you look at those films, he would set at the seven step drop and then he'd start kind of drifting to his left, mm. which made me a guard rather than a tackle because I couldn't, as, you know, I could not allow any uh, on the upfield right. rush. I couldn't, I could, you know, that, that shortened the corner. So with a guy that's six, six, um, you know, and rushing like that, you know, it, it really puts a lot of pressure. And uh, so for that, those reasons, you know, um, you know, we, uh, you know, we threw the ball, we ran the ball and, and, um, and, and it was a, and it was a win. And, and, uh, you know, you get to, you get to, you get to contribute in a way that has an impact. So mm. that, that's, you know, you understand that. It, oh, absolutely. A, that's what you, that's what you want to do. You want to be able to contribute to your team. I like it. <laughs> John Deke here. Uh, just curious, you mentioned Chuck Noll. Do you have a favorite story or uh, <laughs> some type of life lesson that sticks out to you the most? <laughs> Obviously, uh, there's a lot of them, right? Uh, everybody that played on those teams has no stories, but is there one that is your favorite? There's, you know, Chuck was, um, I had more conversation with Chuck when I coached than I did as a player. And and Chuck had a hard time communicating individually with players. He uh, communicated as a head coach to the team. Uh, I thought very straightforward, and and we we there were mature guys, so he didn't need to. He you know he got a lot of criticism because he never gave a pep talk, but you know his his answer to the reporters was. Hey, if it's fourth and one foot, I can't go out and cheerlead. I'm on the sideline. So I've got to prepare them for, so they go out and, uh, I can't, I can't give me a cheerleader when it's, when it's on the line. And so I think we appreciated him coaching that way, but at the same time he tried. And I remember 
uh, it was my second year author and I, you know, my position, my first year was L one on the kickoff and oh, snapping wow. deep punts. Wow. You know, I didn't get to, <laughs> I didn't get to play that much on, uh, on, you know, on offense. Uh, so when I came to camp the second year and I'd gotten, moved, I'd been moved from center to tackle and they just moved me. They didn't say, okay, here's the, here's how you play tackle. Uh, they didn't send me any, uh, uh, playbook. They, oh. You know, I just come to training camp and I see the roster and I go out and, and, you know, you, you know what everybody else is doing. So I'm trying to figure this out as I'm going. And, uh, and so, and, and so, you know, I had some good days and I had some days where I just did, you know, I didn't know what I was doing. So I, I, you know, I had some mental mistakes and, uh, some of the mental, you know, you can not mental mistakes in that you're blocking the wrong guy, but mental mistakes in that you step with the wrong foot. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, the technique, the technique stuff. my right. technique was just, I, there was no such thing. And so anyway, there was, there was a lot of good. And I mean, there was a lot of bad too. So it was between practices and uh, I got that knock on the door. Not and, the knock, uh, nobody wants to knock on the door. <laughs> and, and the coach said, and the, the little kid come in that always, he's the one that they, and, and he said, uh, coach, no wants to see you. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, Oh man. <laughs> Now, I didn't think I was doing that bad. <laughs> the Grim Reaper so, is on my door. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, so I grab my playbook, and I start walking down the hallway, and, I, and I'm, and i like, getting really angry. <laughs> and so I, I was so angry that I thought, okay, he didn't say bring the playbook. So I... I thought, well, I'll walk in there, and when he says, where's your playbook, I'll say, well, he didn't tell me to bring the playbook. So I went back, because I was, you know, I was going to be, uh, I was going to be, uh, I don't know, whatever it is, I was going <laughs> to hold my, you know. so I walked back in, and then St. Vincent in that dorm that we were in, the back wall was made out of bricks. Mm. So when I saw the wall, I thought, Okay, and I threw my playbook, Arthur, as hard as I could <laughs> against that black wall, and it busted open, and ten thousand pages went everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought somebody is going to have a, a fun day putting this back together. <laughs> so then I walked down the hallway, and just before I knocked on the door, this tear came. So I had to back up and get my face, you know, all fixed. <laughs> <laughs> and then I knocked on the door and Chuck had his back to me and he turns around and he says, Oh, John, come in. And he's nice. And that made me even madder because if you get me cut, you don't want the coach to be nice to you, you know? <laughs> and he goes, here's what he said, Arthur. He goes, I was on vacation in the Everglades this year and I heard you liked the out of doors. And so wow. I took these pictures of these affiliated woodpeckers <laughs> And he starts explaining, I never heard of the pileated woodpecker. <laughs> and they have these fancy red feathers and blue feathers and stuff like that. That's what the pileation is. <laughs> so I'm standing there thinking I'm getting cut, and he's telling me about woodpeckers. Oh, wow. <laughs> so we finish the woodpeckers, and I'm standing there, and then he has pictures of alligators. <laughs> and he starts explaining the difference between alligators and crocodiles. <laughs> And I'm so, I mean, I can't even hardly stand there. I just want to know, am I cut or traded? I, I just want to get out of St. Vincent. <laughs> and so finally he sees I'm upset and he goes, well, I'm sorry to bother you. I just thought you'd like to look at these pictures. You can go back to your room. Wow. <laughs> and I said, I said, I'm not cut. And he goes, no, why would I cut you? You're having a great training camp. Oh. He says, you're learning, but I mean, you're, you're, you're picking it up. And I said, I'm not cut. And he goes, no, why would you think you're cut? And I said, oh. So I walk back, and I'm going, I'm not cut. Oh, it's great. I'm not cut. And I get back to my room, and I go in the door, and it's now two minutes before practice. And I'm trying to pick up my playbook because oh. it's scattered all over the place. <laughs> 
And I had to walk down to the meeting with my playbook in 5,000 pieces, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that might be my favorite Chuck Noll story. Because it kind of you know, <laughs> tells you, you know, he wanted to, he wanted to kind of be able to, to talk with these players. Right. But he always had to have, um, you know, he, it always had to be an educational setting. It was never a setting like what we're doing right now, right. where you just kind of share inner thoughts and feelings and stuff. And, uh, and, and even towards the end of his life, after uh, he'd quit coaching and I was no longer in the league when I would see him, even then sometimes it was difficult uh, because, because he, he never really, uh, I don't think with any of the any of us really uh, was able to just share. Uh, I, I I learned more about him personally from Marianne, his wife, than I did mm. from him. Okay, man. See, the fact that he sent the the <laughs> Grim Reaper, the cut guy, to come knock on your yep. door. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But you know what? <laughs> One other thing too, to give you the idea, and this is kind of funny. We so we play uh, we play Cleveland. Mm-hmm. And and I remember distinctly the 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 day was October 26th. We're in Cleveland, uh, and it's uh, 6:30 in the morning. Pre-game meals at seven. Or excuse me, chapel services at seven. I'm just getting out of the phone, out of the shower, and the phone rings. And um, and my roommate at that time, Sam had retired. So the last two years, my roommate was Terry Bradshaw. And you know, if you see Terry on TV, what you see is where he is. <laughs> a little bit different yeah. and uh, and so as i as i get out of the shower terry goes um uh, well just boil water and so i'm drying off and i come in and uh i said who did you tell boil water and he goes oh your wife called and i said you told her to boil water and he says yeah uh, she called to tell you that her water broke and they're taking her to the hospital and I said, and you told her to, to boil water. <laughs> wow. And, and Terry's going, yeah, we got to play a ball game. Oh. And so I'm like, <laughs> I'm a, so I call her back and she was pretty upset. <laughs> so anyway, I, I go down to the pregame meal and I tell Chuck that, uh, and we are taking the bus to Cleveland. Did you guys take the bus to Cleveland? Oh yeah, yeah we still do that. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. So we taking the bus to Cleveland, but, uh, the scouts had a plane and at the airport. So Chuck comes up to me and he, and he says, and he says, John, after the game, we're going to fly you home on the scouts plane. They can take the bus. You can fly home on the scouts plane and we'll get you to the hospital as quick as we can. So, um, and that's kind of a funny thing too, uh, because they, they flew me home. I didn't take a shower. I had, uh, <laughs> uh, because I didn't want to hold them up and I was trying to get there and I, I had, uh, uh, you know, my arms were all scraped up. My, they were, they were dirty and my knuckles were bloody. <laughs> so the nurse thought I'd been in bar fights and my wife wasn't going <laughs> to let me in the room. <laughs> But, you know, but I think that tells about Chuck, too, in that, you know, he cared about you, you know, and the fact that he flew me home on his plane and had, you know, was and I got there and I ended up getting there in time to see Tanner, my son, born. Man, that's awesome, man. That's kind of cool. Yeah, that's awesome. Now, you have your foundation that you started, uh, Adventures in Training with a Purpose. And I've been a part of some of the things that you've done in the community, um, but I wanted people to to hear from you. So, man, just talk about ATP and ultimately what inspired it. Well, yeah, thanks for for that opportunity. Um, in, in a lot of ways, author, our culture is upside down. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, and for, for example, in healthcare, uh, if you um, if you um, if you have an acute problem, you break your arm, uh, you tear your ACL or something. The United States is a is a great place to get fixed up, right? Acute because definitely. Uh, we have you know medical care there is, is 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 best in the world. But if you have a chronic condition, and what's a chronic condition? It's not going to get better, right? 
Okay. Uh, so we have people with Parkinson's. We've had, we have people that have, have had strokes. We have people that, uh, I have six people right now that are paralyzed. Mm. And, and so this is not a good, the culture here is upside down and it's all into, it's all about numbers. And I think the best way to explain it is like the NFL combine. That's all about numbers. So I'm from Oklahoma state. I go to the combine. I run a four, six, five, 40. You do the bench presses, you run, change of direction, four, five, you vertical jump 30 inches and all that stuff. And now they say, now you're a third round draft choice. Okay. How come? Right. Because of those numbers. Okay. So now what happens is one of our people, um, uh, his father had shoulder surgery and yeah. that afternoon he was in a motor vehicle accident. He's paralyzed. Mm -hmm. They both got 12 weeks of surgery or 12 weeks of therapy. So it's numbers. You get 12 weeks right. of therapy. Yeah. And once they say that you have reached your maximum medical potential, you don't get any more. So then you spend your rest of your life and you get urinary tract infections. You get, uh, and eventually you're going to probably end up dying of pneumonia. Mm. And that's what happened to Superman. Uh, if you remember. Oh yeah. Uh, and so the OG uh, Superman I, original. <laughs> Yeah, the the um, Christopher, Christopher Reeves, Reeves Superman. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, and and so we see this all all the time with people, and and they don't have any they have they don't have any options. Uh, they they uh, I just left this morning. I was working with um, a family, and they have a daughter. She's forty eight. She doesn't speak. She's never spoken her life. Mm. Uh, she's severely mentally challenged, and yet they get. 10 weeks of therapy per year. So they have to save them. So if they use those therapy, those therapy treatments up and then something happens, then she's already used up her therapy. And so she comes and we work with her and do various movement programs. So there's a Bible verse and it says in, and it's in Acts and it says in him talking about Jesus, we live, we move and we have our being. And I think that's a neat, verse when you think about it to me it's it's a sandwich live is one piece of bread right. have your being is the other but what's in the middle move mm. and movement it turns out there's tons of research i can uh that um talks about uh in fact i thought in case we get a chance to talk about it i, I pulled up a, co a couple of these quotes and these are out of textbooks and uh, one of them says uh what makes us move is also what makes us think. And the same textbook talks about motor development or movement development provides the framework used to sequence the patterns needed for academic concepts. Well, it turns out not only academic concepts, but emotional concepts as well. So we have, um, we have people that have, have had strokes. We work with, uh, uh, we have, Right now, probably, I think around 45, not not only veterans, but active duty uh, uh, military that uh, from everything from stroke and but also PTSD. We, we mm. have several uh, military with PTSD. So what does our program do? Well, we don't have I mean, we're not going to be you know, we don't provide surgery and we're not even providing physical therapy because, again, that's the number stuff. What we're doing is providing movement skills, and those would be uh, skills uh, like um, we we do. For example, one of my favorite things to do at clinics, Arthur, is to find somebody that can bench press four hundred pounds. And you know how you walk when you can bench press four hundred oh, yeah. pounds. You stick your lats big out. Big chest, big chest. Yeah, you got the big <laughs> chest and the big. You stick your lats out and you come up there. And so I usually have them. Uh, you know, say, okay, you, obviously you bench 400 pounds, so you could do a push up. And the guy's now, he's kind of sneering, and I, I want to have him a little pissed off. So <laughs> got him a little pissed off. And, and so I, you know, I get a big stability blow up ball and a medicine ball. And I have him put his hands on the medicine ball, thumb stretching, and his feet on the stability ball and do a push up. Game changer. Well, then, then I go back to doing my clinic. 
you know, and he can't even stay on the ball, say nothing to do a push up. And then if he's really ticked off at me before he started, you know, if you will, then I, I start making fun of him and say, hey, excuse me, I thought, did I misunderstood? I, I thought you said you could do a push up. How many of you got here? You know, well, the guy's embarrassed and he just keeps falling off. And so those are, those are what we call uh, complex movement. It's not complicated, right. but it's complex. Uh, and, uh, and so we use a lot of the stability balls and, uh, with a, a lot of our people with PTSD, uh, we do things like walk on slack lines. We te- we juggle because we walk on stilts, we walk on pogo sticks, uh, uh, and because those are not complicated movements, but they, they force us to work various parts of the brain that have to integrate together. And so we, we have an after school program as well. We have 210, uh, I guess the easiest way to describe would be inner city kids. Okay. Uh, that we, um, um, do after school programs with. And, and so it, it, um, we do those same things. Uh, one of the things I do with our veterans too, as well, is we do, uh, a lot of boxing combinations. So, uh, a left, jab would be a one a right jab would be a right. two uh a three is a hook and so uh you you take focus mitts and put on the gloves and you you know you're you're you're, you're doing this sequence of numbers one of our veterans learned 25 boxing combinations in three days like and it. And, and, you know, I, if you give me the letter P and say, start the alphabet at P, I would, you know, I, I can't, okay, A, B, C, D, F, G, H, K, L, M, L, P, Q, P, Q, okay. Uh, but they would, not only did he learn those 25 combinations, but they would say, okay, start at 12. And he would start at 12. He could start at 12 and pick them up. Wow. And, and so, uh, we do, so we do the boxing, com- boxing combinations are, are a big part of what we're doing with them, but it's a lot of the balance. I, I take a stability ball and have people, you sit on it. Uh, you know what I'm talking about, those big absolutely, balls. Yeah, and, absolutely. and you have to balance with your feet higher than your hips yeah. and, uh, and stay on it. Okay. That's not a complicated movement, but it's complex. Absolutely. And so it loses, it uses the front, right, left, back. It uses all the lobes of your brain. It, everything's interactive. The cerebellum's telling everything where to move. And, and you know what else is cool about it? As, for example, if I'm a linebacker, okay, and I'm getting a counter, and you know, you read, you're an inside backer, you read counter, and you, you don't lean with your shoulders. You step with your hips so that you can come back for the counter mm-hmm. uh should, anyway that's the way we should be doing it and i'm for me it's a pass protection if somebody gives me an outside move and comes back in me so those are complex movement skills and that's what our program really consists of and the research there's tons of research that that and it does we see the um, improvement in people cognitively our students improve cognitively um and um they, there's an emotional improvement, and then with our uh, older people as well, our chronic, our chronic condition people, it gives them uh, not something that they cannot uh, accomplish. Uh, we've got one young man; uh, his name's Matt, and uh, 13 years ago he was paralyzed. Uh, we've been working with him for two and a half years. Progress is slow, but guess what? A month ago, he took his first steps using uh, parallel bars, That's and so awesome. he walked. He took three steps, and now he's walking the length of the parallel bars. I like that. So, so it's it's awesome. Yeah. Uh, some days I get up and I'm going, oh man, you know, you know how you feel. Oh yeah. But then I go to work <laughs> go and you work. <laughs> yeah, and you see somebody like this, and they're they're like in the they're like a airplane that just it's gone down the runway. They've been do- going down the runway. You know, you've been done that. Is this plane really going to take off here in a right. minute? And all of a sudden, here it lifts off. You know, and and when these people do the lift off, it it's like it's really it's really neat. That's fulfilling and impactful, man. And I know just from our times together, you could just see 
how important it is to you to help out, to really invest not only your your resources, but your time. You know, and that's the thing that I always admired about you and that I still do admire about you, especially when it comes to your focus with ATP, man. Well, thank you. You know, and, and it, it is just, it's so, I don't even know the word. Uh, you know, what do people like to, what gives people, you know, me, uh, my son's into whitewater kayaking. So I go, you know, over the waterfalls with him and believe it or not, I guess that's fun. But for me, it is. So you go rock climbing. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, and some, you know, I, I don't understand golf. I have not ever had a fun hitting this ball and it, and it goes, it will never go straight. It'll go to the, it'll slice every single time, <laughs> no matter how I do my feet. That's not fun. But this stuff, so everybody has, I think, their fun thing that just brings gratitude and, and, um, uh, and that's that works for us. Yeah. No, that's awesome. Because uh, I was I was actually just about to ask you if you could elaborate a little more. Why why helping and why is that important to you? Like you know, helping others and and doing all this. Like where does that come from? Um, I think a couple things. Uh, first off, the the program is a Christian based program, and and so I can't help somebody. If you want me, I can barely work my cell phone. So that's not my, um, <laughs> the, you know, but I don't know why, but I mean, I get to teach kinesiology at Youngstown State. I don't know why I, but I can, I can study the, the neurology, you know, and I teach at Redneck, you know, and the syllabus I'm supposed to talk about, arthrology, osteology, myology, and neurology. But I, you know, I teach bones, joints, muscles, and nerves and how they move. <laughs> and and so, uh, like I said a while ago, movement that, you know, that, that Bible verse that says in him we, we live, we move, and we have our being. And when you take somebody that can't move, they stop living. Uh, I, author, I, I'm, I'm blessed. I played 13 years and, uh. I'm not sure, you know, uh, I missed a couple games at about the 10th year mm. I um, because I tore some ligaments in my ankle. Uh, but after a while, I said, okay, I'm going to take this thing up and play. <laughs> after a couple, you know, you, can, you, know, you know how you feel. Uh, you're, uh, you're, cause the guy playing in my place, too, is doing pretty well. So. <laughs> <laughs> hey, talk about that pressure. Yeah, we so, know how it is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, uh, but – when you can't move, you know, I, so I had actually my first surgery two and a half years ago and I had to be in a wheelchair for one week. And that one week I was like, uh, I'd go to class and people thought I was trying to hit them, but I just get, it's hard to ride a wheelchair for <laughs> in a straight line, <laughs> you know, and you know, you, you try, you got to get out of the wheelchair, you got to get out of your car, you got, you know, and, and I was still, you know, able to move around in the wheelchair for a week. But when, when you can, you know, when you have people, the, um, the word hope is so important. And, uh, my wife will say somebody's on the wrong side of hope, mm -hmm. whether you're on the wrong side of hope or whether you've lost hope, both of those are the life stopped. You, you know, uh, there was a, one of my favorite quotes is by uh, 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 Albert Schweitzer, and he said, the tragedy of life is what dies inside of a person mm. while they're still living. Mm. And we've all seen those people that they have a heartbeat, but they're, but, but they're not living. You know, and, and I think that is the greatest gift to me. If you have the capacity to help somebody living again. And, you know, and here in that verse is live, move, and have our being. And having your being, it's, it's kind of like your DNA. You know, it's not like just I'm a plant and I'm alive, but I'm, I'm alive, alive. Right. You know, <laughs> I, I'm able to, to experience life and, and, not, and live it. Um, and whether it's some people for golf or some people for whatever, you're able to experience that. Um, you know, I, um, I guess another way for me, uh, I call it lessons of the, of the river 
because I've been kayaking enough with my son. We did 110 miles down the middle fork of the Salmon River this summer. And I think we went over like 25 waterfalls during that time. And honestly, uh, I was, every one of those waterfalls, it was like running down on a kickoff blindfolded. <laughs> you know. Because, That's dangerous, I mean, man. That's dangerous. You know, because yeah, yeah. you don't. When you, you know, hey, you run down on kickoff. Yeah. The guy in front of you is not the guy blocking you. Not at all. He's just setting you up because somebody's the coming across the blind side's coming, you. without a yeah. doubt. <laughs> yeah. And so you're going down these waterfalls, and there's rocks everywhere. <laughs> and and so I actually hit a rock uh, my 10, 10 yards in front of the waterfall, which oh, flipped man. my kayak backwards, and I went over one of them. I, I went over the waterfall backwards. <laughs> oh. That's not fun. <laughs> But yeah. but one thing, one of the, there's two really big lessons of the river. One is when you hit a rock, you have to. One of my Navy SEALs that we work with said, "I said you got to lean into the rock." And after we we came back from the river, he said, "John, you don't lean into the rock. You got to embrace the rock." And I went, "Yeah, hmm. yeah." Because if we just lean into hardships, that's not good enough, Arthur. Right. You know that. No I mean, question. you've experienced that. You've got to embrace it. And that's one of the things I learned from one of our guys that was a Navy SEAL. That you know, you, And the other one is you, you have a tendency as you go over the waterfall to stop paddling. Because you're going, ah, you know, <laughs> in just about it's two seconds, you're, you're going to drop. <laughs> Yeah, in about two seconds, you're going to drop. And at the bottom of the waterfall in the rapids, and these are not like waterfalls like Niagara Falls. They're, it's kind of like going over a slide when you were a kid. You know, it, okay, it kind yeah. of goes down at that angle. But at the bottom of it, there's what's called, they call it a hydraulic, and it's, it recycles you. And so if you just go down in there, you just get turned over and over and over and over and over. You've got to paddle hard going over it so you have enough momentum to come back out of that hole wow. and then up and out so so those are some things i particularly with our with our veterans that we do is we we do three days a week of training but then we have an adventure day adventure because our program's adventures and training with the purpose right and so that adventure day could be going over the waterfalls you know, and uh, and learning the, the event, you know, learning the, the river lessons of you got to paddle over the waterfall because if you don't, you end up getting recycled and just turned, you know, turned upside down over and over again. Uh, my my son has one guy he works with, and he said, Dad, this guy's got a natural flip up, mm. and he's blind, and he wow. goes kayaking, but when he hits the rock, and his kayak gets flipped upside down, he said he's got a natural flip up. You know, it's like when a running back that just, you know, you see them, they get hit, knocked it up, you know, upside, right. but they just kind of land on their feet. Oh, mm -hmm. This guy's got a natural flip up. So we work with people that lost their flip up. And, uh, and, and, and then those are some of the things that we do. Other things, you know, we, we last week we went, uh, trap shooting, uh, and then sometimes we go rock climbing, sometimes mountain biking. And uh, so we have three days a week that we, we do functional training, like I mentioned. And then we, do, we take a fourth day and try to make that an adventure day. Uh, so because there's, you know, in all of those experiences, then we can come back and talk about, well, what's the life lesson uh, of, of shooting the clay pigeon? Well, if I just point at what, what's there... Uh, at that target, I'm, I'm going to be behind it. I got to get in front of it. Absolutely. You know, so we, we go out and we, we've had fun shooting. Uh, uh, but, uh, but each one of those, uh, you know, rock climbing, each one of those, you know, I don't know how long you wanted to talk, but each one of those, there is a, uh, there's life lessons that we can talk about. One of the simplest ones in rock climbing is uh, when I'm climbing those rocks, somebody's got my rope. 
because and so when I'm up there 40, 50, 60, 70, the highest I've ever climbed is 270 feet. Gosh. Okay. So, I mean, I've climbed uh, mountains that were uh, 12,000 feet, but the highest I've ever been where if I fell, it was going to be 270 feet. Uh, somebody better have your rope. Absolutely. When you're climbing. <laughs> and then so when we come back from that, you know, one of the things that uh, uh, and my my son Tanner came up with this is who's got your rope now when we get home and you're in the rest of this week the rest of your life who's got your rope now because um, we got to have somebody having a rope and for me from a Christian stand, standpoint my you know my faith uh, as a Christian Christ has my rope mm. but I need I mean I need teammates as well you know and the Bible talks about a cord of three strands isn't easily broken. So right. what are those three stands? One is you. The other one is your teammate. That would be me. And the third one then would be the Lord. And so who's got your rope there? So those, that's one reason I like to do the uh, uh, functional training as, as, as well. I mean, the adventure training as well as the functional training. I like that. Now, with you being with the Steelers for 13 seasons, right? I know you had to have a favorite team. And you talked about you room with uh, Sam Davis for, what, 10 of those years, correct? And then after yes. that, you said you switched to Terry uh, Bradshaw. So just talk yes. about who was your favorite teammate during that time and why? Um, probably the guy – no, not probably. The, definitely the guy I was closest to was uh, Larry Brown. I played left tackle. He played right tackle. Uh, I think in a football uh, on a team – the the four guys that mentally have it the most difficult are the two cornerbacks, and on our, my team it was J T Thomas and Mel Blunt. J T, uh, yeah, yeah, and and unfortunately, uh, J T is an all pro guy, but he's playing opposite Mel Blunt, who's right. six four. Uh, you know, runs a. Three nine four, you know what I mean. <laughs> and, you know, and does uh, you a know, genetic freak jumps over, over you know jumps over the buildings and stuff. But JT, uh, if you look at JT on one interception in Super Bowl nine, uh, he took the ball away. I mean, he comes up, bang, takes the ball right over the middle of the field, out of the receiver's hands, and runs it back up the field. It was one of the most amazing interceptions and returns I've ever seen. So JT was um, he, he was awesome. And in fact, JT gave us part of our. Uh, uh, JT is a really good friend of mine now. He said he gave me something the other day, uh, and here's what he said, Arthur. He said, "We don't need more competition." I'm talking about young people. Mm. Okay, he said, we don't need, and I'm talking about uh, people, even like you, yourself and myself. He said, we don't need more competition. We need more challenge. Mm. And JC, JT said to me, he goes, um, so take the word challenge and spell it, C-H-A-L-L-E-N-G. All right, now take the L-L-E, take the C-H-A, and then take the E L L out mm -hmm. and then hook up the N G E. What do you have? You got change. Mm. You see that? I mean, Absolutely. I'm, we're talking in kind of like air, but if you take the, uh, <laughs> I'm following it. <laughs> H A L L E N. Okay. The L L E out. Right. And then you connect the C H A and the N G E. You got change. And so our, our uh, logo has a guy climbing a mountain. Mm hmm. And there's kind of a cross made out of the snow, but CHA goes up one side, NGE goes down the other side, and then there's a little ELL -L like in that. the middle of the top of the mountain. I like that. So when you, when you, you know, we, we need, and I think till the day you die, you need a challenge because challenge is going to make you change. So JT and I were, you know, he, we were pretty close as players. We're really close now, as but my closest probably uh, I would have to say would be Larry Brown, because on the offensive side, uh, 
the guards have the center right in you know inside and and so the the defensive tackle he's not coming inside because Mike Webster's going to oh no question <laughs> yeah it's Mike over. Webster's going to jack him up <laughs> <laughs> but I got a guy one on one every every pass play and uh, and you don't do your job then you know if if JT gets beat it costs six points and they and they run it back 14 times and show him getting beat and uh you know and he's you know it's it's um you know so he's gotta he's gotta be mentally tough mm-hmm. to, to recover from that and he's gotta be mentally tough not to get beat uh a, a tackle particularly a left tackle if you have a right-handed quarterback uh if it's a right tackle at least the quarterback that's right-handed if the right tackle gets beat he can at least see something coming and step up right but uh, the left tackle you know they call it the blind side and most people don't i mean that's something you say but most people don't even don't think about means, the implication yeah. of it <laughs> when you give up a sack as a left tackle your your quarterback is uh it's when he's most vulnerable. You know, that could be a season. Anything, yeah. Yeah, that could be an injury. That could be a season-ending injury. And uh, and and so, you know, uh, I won't make fun of you linebackers, but the linebacker <laughs> can miss a – you know, you can miss a tackle and the strong safety comes right up. You know, Absolutely. Two-yard gain. No harm, no okay. foul. We're good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, you know, I mess up. I don't have I don't have that uh, strong safety to help and and Franco, you know what his nickname was? <laughs> you ask him. We call it, his nickname was Stingby. Stingby. <laughs> because on those rare occasions when we had when they called maximum protection and uh, you know and Franco was supposed to stay in and get a bump uh-huh. on our guy before he leaves, <laughs> you know, just to keep you know Franco would. He would shut his eyes and he would, you, you know, and he'd bump you. And, <laughs> and I'd say, Franco, they, if they call maximum protection, I'd say, please just get out of the way. And he'd say, no, I'm going to sting him this time. I'm really going to oh, sting him man. this time. <laughs> so, no, Franco, don't sting him. Just get out of the way. <laughs> I like that. So, so, Larry and I sat together on planes. We ate dinner together. We, uh, you know, we hung out, uh, we still hang out together, you know, uh, and another thing, author, um, I, I grew up in Oklahoma and, uh, in my hometown, it was, it was very, it was a great place to grow up because we had Mexican kids, we had mm-hmm. black kids, we had Indian kids and we had white kids. And it was, it was a situation where, it's like a team that probably that you experience. Nobody cared. Right. But Larry and JT, JT was the first black player to play at Florida state. Mm-hmm. And Larry, um, grew up in Florida as well. Uh, and actually, uh, JT grew up in Macon, Georgia, but Larry grew up in a segregated school. And then his senior year, he got, he, uh, he got to go to an integrated school, but he couldn't take a shower uh, after practice with the team. And at the pregame meal, he had to go in a different door. Mm. This is in my, again, this right. is the United States and this is a teammate. And this is something that I couldn't even imagine, you know? And, uh, and so those kinds of things, I think brought us together too. Because, uh, 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 you know, like the kneeling before the, the national anthem. Right. You know, my dad was a World War II veteran, and I'm like, what, what's going on here? Man, stand up for the flag. Right. But I I didn't experience some of the things that uh, – JT has a scar right under his mustache. Mm. You, know, you know why he's got the scar? Because he couldn't read the sign that said for whites only. Wow. And he was four years old, and he's drinking a water fountain. And he got his head slammed into the water fountain. And so uh, we had we had guys that had grown up with that, and now we're on a Super Bowl team, 
and and we came together and we're still friends um and and now i'm a better man i think i hope i'm a better man i think i'm a better man i think you are because <laughs> because i uh i didn't know you know i grew up in my little town where everybody sang kumbaya held hands and went on hay rides <laughs> you know and and i didn't know what uh what ha- what was happening uh, I saw on TV in Little Rock, Arkansas, which is only 180 miles from me, but I still, I, I never experienced it. And, and uh, so those, so those were some, I think some um, things that built relationships on our team. I mean, they were bad as those guys were growing up, but, but they, they, uh, as, as we shared and, and, uh, you know, as we shared and, uh, off season because Larry Brown and I worked out together every day in the off season. Mm-hmm. Okay. Arthur, Larry Brown was six five, two seventy five. He had a thirty five inch waist. <laughs> he close grip bench press four ninety five. Yeah, that's crazy. when he walks in the room, his <laughs> triceps come in like ten minutes later. I mean, they're, <laughs> you know, so he was my training partner every day, and so you you train together and you grow together mentally and spiritually i think as well um and he's one of my you know those are the guys i call first when when i'm trying to get a a fundraiser and then they're always there you know Mm -hmm. so um yeah i don't want to just say those are my friends they 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 are my friends and and john banazak uh now john John. and i were different because we had to bang each other every day (laughs) And you know how it is. Sometimes times when you're banging and sometimes, yeah, you get in a fight at practice. You get close. And it's a real fight. <laughs> but, yeah, I don't know how to explain it. The real world won't understand. Right. It, but, <laughs> you know, but John Banizak, I mean, his his wife and my wife were best friends. And I'd come home and I'd gotten a fight with John Banizak during practice. And then... Uh, she would be, she'd spent the day with Mary and they'd been out shopping. You know, I'd get <laughs> pissed off again. <laughs> All right, it's like that in football, man. You, you bond through it. And, uh, you know, just speaking of football and obviously you had your, your, I mean, just crazy amount of knowledge that we're getting from you today. But one thing that we always like to ask when we're like ending up the podcast and everything like that, just to talk about your welcome to the NFL moment. <laughs> Yeah, uh, that's funny too that you asked that. Uh, <laughs> it's almost like we had we rehearsed this. Um, when I came into the league, they had the college all star game, mm-hmm. and they don't have it anymore because guys don't wouldn't play in it because they they make so much money they don't want to take a chance on getting hurt. Right. Uh, but what it was was that they would pick a uh, the all Americans from the college would play the Super Bowl champions. Whoa, and what? so my senior year in college, <laughs> you said they picked the college all Americans to play against the Super Bowl champions. Is that what you said? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Oh and we gosh. played in so- Soldiers Field. <laughs> uh huh. And and so my uh, senior year, uh, you know, I graduated, and before I went to training camp, uh, we went to Chicago and we practiced for three weeks, and then we played the Jets. So my first professional football game, I'm playing the previous Super Bowl champions. Holy cow. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, and Joe Namus is a quarterback Yo. and all that. Yeah. Bravo, yeah. So, Joe. Oh, man. And and I would even say this. There was a movie, L, uh, L. Roy Crazy Legs Hurts, that I saw when I was in grade school. And he played in that game. <laughs> And from the time I was in the sixth grade, that was my dream was to play in that game. Yeah. So, I, you know, I grew up, I was so blessed to, to be in a class of 67 kids. And then, <laughs> and then I leave Oklahoma and I go to Chicago and I'm playing, you know, in Soldier's Field. And, and anyway, so I got to training camp late. And, uh, uh, and so, um, at that time, that there was a tradition that rookies had to get up, stand in their chair, 
put their hand on their heart and sing the school song. <laughs> and so I remember being, I remember being, uh, before the draft, I thought I want to play in the NFL, but I'm not going to get up in a chair and sing my school song for anybody. <laughs> okay, here we go. <laughs> and, uh, and so, um, uh, anyway, uh, I got there late and at lunchtime I'm sitting there, I'm eating as fast as I can. Cause I, I think somebody is going to ask me to sing the school song and, and, and I'm not going to do it. I, I made up my mind, no matter what it cost, I wasn't going to do it. All right. All right. So they didn't ask me, but I didn't understand that they, that it happens in the evening meal. <laughs> and so now the <laughs> So now everybody, all the other rookies have been singing for two weeks because I was late coming to training camp because of being in that college all-star game. Right. So that night, I they said, John, stand up and sing the school song. <laughs> and so I remember that feeling, you know, and I, and I remember the guy. His name was Bruce Van Dyke. He was the <laughs> starting right guard said sing sing the school song you know and everybody's laughing and hollering and hooping you know you know what i mean oh yeah okay? absolutely yeah and uh so i i stood up slowly and i looked at him and i said no uh oh uh oh uh oh and 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 i heard that just the place got quiet <laughs> and they you know now they're just they're 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 mocking me and uh so that was in the evening. We're still in two days, and that next morning practice, it was that was. I mean, for the next three days, it was the most miserable. I mean, <laughs> th they were cheap shots. <laughs> and then, and then that night they would say, "You're gonna sing," and I go, "No." <laughs> so now, after the fourth day, Joe Green was the number one draft court choice. Mm -hmm. So that my rookie year. There was Joe Green, and and then I was drafted, and also LC, LC Greenwood. Yeah. So we were the guys that kind of stuck around for. Actually, we all played thirteen years. Came the same year and played thirteen years, mm -hmm. and uh, so. But Joe, he had came in late as well, and um, and so now it's the fourth day that I've had to put up with this. And so Joe finally signed. He he'd held out. He signed his contract. He comes into camp, and so that evening meal, I'll never forget. So let me see how it's the best way to tell this. So now then, they don't ask me. They're hooping and hollering. They said, "Joe, stand up, sing the North Texas State fight song." <laughs> and Joe stands up, and he has a toothpick in his mouth, and he stands up and he spits it out. <laughs> And he said, all right, which one of you? And he said this word that starts with mother. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, which one of you is going to make me sing the school song? Uh oh. <laughs> and 58 guys grabbed their fork, put their head down and started. <laughs> and he goes. That's what I got. That's what I thought. Oh, man. <laughs> and, and I can tell you this, Arthur, the entire time I was there, and I was there for 23 years, <laughs> nobody ever sang a song after that. <laughs> <laughs> but that's my rookie. Oh, I like it, man. <laughs> <laughs> that was incredible. Oh, I like that. Real, real quick, what happened in the college all-star game? The, Where's the, the Jets? Yeah. <laughs> How yeah, they, how they, go uh, for you? they beat us. I think they beat us by, <laughs> I guess you could check it out in some kind of website thing. Uh, it, it went right down to the last two minutes. I think oh, they wow. beat us by like five points. No oh, wow, okay. Yeah, it, it was a good game. Who was the quarterback uh, for your team? Uh, Terry Hanratty, who was drafted by the Steelers. Uh, uh, Joe was the first choice. Uh, Terry was the second pick. I was, I ended up, I was the third pick. And, uh, so Terry Henry was our starting quarterback. And then he came, you know, then we uh, came to Pittsburgh as rookies that year. And Terry uh, played, he started about half the games his rookie year. And then the next year, 
By the way, we were one in thirteen. <laughs> Yikes! And <laughs> Pittsburgh Steelers were one in thirteen, and then so we got the first pick, and they drafted this guy from Louisiana Tech named Terry Bradshaw. <laughs> and I think I've heard of him maybe once or twice. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny, man. Hey, John, we definitely appreciate you taking time out, man. Dropping the knowledge that you did for us for the podcast, man, definitely means a lot. Well, I appreciate it. You know what? And it's it's great for me now, and I really mean this. Um, yourself, uh, some of the other guys, some of the other guys that I've gotten to know that that came, at, you know, came after me. It's really neat that. Uh, even though we didn't, uh, and even if you didn't have 55, I would still be buddies. You know? <laughs> I was say, it's, still, it's the brotherhood, man. Once you're, yeah, you know how you know, it there is. is family. There is, there is a brotherhood, and, and uh, I appreciate it. So, No uh, doubt, man. I definitely appreciate no, I you. I absolutely appreciate it. It was awesome. Thank yes, you. indeed. And keep doing that awesome work, too, with ATP, man. You're definitely making a difference. Will do. Okay, yeah. stay in touch. All Thanks. right, will do. Awesome. Thank All you right. so much. You betcha. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.